thank you to those of you who are here. Uh, and uh, thank you also for the, uh, the research funding to make this, uh, this all possible. Um, so I, I want to do just a bit of an introduction here and uh, uh, sort of give thanks as well to the fact that we are on the traditional unceded uh, territories of the Lekwungen and Kwisepsen families. And uh, that actually became a part of my my uh, research leave as well, because I was actively involved in the Walk With Me uh, experience in terms of developing that, and that ran actually the second week of my, my research leave, and then in mid-February again, and we had all this development stuff going on throughout this, so it's part of why I have a button here on this, and uh, it's been, it's, uh, that was actually really helpful in terms of helping me understand a whole lot. So. Uh, I know many people are, are curious about my name. Um, I am sort of, of uh, my stepfather is uh, Ishwar Gupta from uh, New Delhi, and uh, he was the head of the physics department at the University of Saskatchewan for quite some time. And uh, so I was originally born in, in Germany, and I came with my mom when I was five to Canada, to Saskatoon, where I grew up and did my undergraduate uh, work. And uh, I lived in uh, sort of in, in Santa Barbara for a time. I was actually with the Alberta Multiculturalism Commission for a, a time as a consultant there. And uh, in Santa Barbara, I completed my doctorate at uh, Fielding Graduate University, which is how I got to meet some really interesting people and uh, had my interests around uh, World Cafe really uh, kindled, to say the least. Um, so uh, my thoughts for today, uh, we have not a whole lot of time, but I wanted just to, to share with you what my intentions were for the, the research lead around uh, a World Cafe as Research Method and Impact book and sort of share with you how, how that sort of proceeded and, and where we were with that. Uh, we actually then engaged in doing some research around the use of the, the cafe and that was uh, quite an interesting experience as well. And then uh, sort of towards the, the last month of my time uh, on my research leave in March, I was uh, asked to come and uh, uh, to the uh, transformations, Action Research Plus transformations gathering in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden at Chalmers University. And uh, that, so I ran a, a world cafe, hosted a world cafe, for the participants of the gathering and, and helping them sort of fine tune where they where that was going to go and that actually will lead into a bit of an invitation because this is sort of an open-ended process where the action research plus transformations group is actually in the process of expanding quite considerably and and really looking for for partners at, at an international level and i'll share how that sort of plays out at that point and then I thought, because this is really important, not just for me to talk, to, but to actually engage people in just a bit of a, an activity around some of the dialogic process here. And so I, th I thought we could do just a, a bit of a, a liberating structure, but it would have been a one, two, four, all, but we don't have time. So it'll be just a one table, all kind of a, a response. So that's my thought and plan. And it's really around, how might that be useful and how does that connect to some of the other work that people are already doing with say Ashoka for example and really intrigued in how we can sort of connect these different initiatives that are going on here. Okay so the book has been in process for an embarrassingly long time and I, I truly am aware that it that, but this takes on a life of its own. It, is, it has been a really quite a remarkable uh, experience. And uh, I sort of have this here because this has been a real partnership between uh, the World Cafe Community Foundation, which, which essentially has and owns and works with the worldcafe.com uh, internet site, which is essentially an, an attempt to, to promote the use of the cafe uh, and sort of see how it's developing. And uh, so the, the executive director of the foundation, Amy Lenzo, has been one of the, the co-authors in this. 
And uh, Fielding Graduate University has been a partner because Fielding has been actively involved since Juanita Brown did her doctoral dissertation on the World Cafe at Fielding. So they actually run a program on hosting and facilitating cafes and, and uh, as a graduate certificate level. Um, and of course, we're involved because, uh, uh, well, as you'll see, uh, we have by far the most numbers of students who do an action-oriented research project using uh, World Cafe as one of the approaches. And uh, it became very clear to me early on in my tenure at Royal Roads here that, in fact, one of the things that became startlingly evident was that uh, Juanita Brown and David Isaacs, who had written the original book uh, in 2005 on the World Cafe, uh, were not really thinking about this in, an, in a scholarly fashion at all. There was no thoughts about research ethics. There was no thought about any of the, 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 that anything could actually be considered data, which, of course, our students do. And so they, I've been, was looking for a long time at how can I, in fact, connect up some of the, the ways in which people are doing this so that every single student wasn't inventing from scratch how to do this. And in fact, as I wound up in conversations with, um, with uh, Juanita and then with Amy and with Fred, Fred was actually on, Fred Steyer from, he's a faculty member in the HOD, Human Organization Development Program, it was on my doctoral committee. And uh, Rosa Zubizaretta is an author in her own right. She's written on dynamic facilitation and uh, is a doctoral student at, uh, at Fielding. And the four of us have had a long sort of standing conversation and, and work with this. So I first met Juanita when she was doing her doctoral dissertation and found that uh, she was totally open with uh, really excited about having people try the approach and, and had very few rules. And as we found, as we were trying to write this book, uh, one of the things is that she wanted to do in writing the, the original book with David Isaacs was to set a very low standard, a low sort of threshold of learning for people. And so there are lots of things that went unstated in her book. And that was, this is sort of in some ways the source of why there's a need for something like this and, and why we're, we're still really working on this. And this started out very simply. So in 1994-95, uh, uh, Juanita and her partner David Isaacs were essentially uh, organizational consultants. And they asked a very simple question, which was, why is it that the most exciting parts, the most memorable parts of a conference are the sessions, not the sessions, but having a cup of coffee with people and talking about what was at the sessions? In between, and so they said, wouldn't it be really interesting if we actually created a process which was all about those sessions, you know, the, the coffee sessions in between? And so that actually started a whole other uh, conversation about what are the minimal critical specifications for a world cafe? Now, does it require the check tablecloths with the flowers and? You know, what is, it, what is actually required there? And if you're going to do all this, uh, do you keep everybody at the same table? Is, you know, how, does, how does this in fact work? And, and so as I started working with students who wanted to do uh, World Cafe as one of their methods, I sort of said, okay, but there's some ethical issues here that you have to think about too. This has to fit within the Tri-Council. This isn't now just a matter of doing an activity. There's a whole set of layers here, including informed consent, that was never a part of what Juanita was describing at all. So where are we at this point? Well, uh, this institution, Royal Roads University, uh, and I'm, you know, I, I think this may be underestimated here, but we've hit about 85 uh, major projects, theses, um, you know, our uh, engaged leadership projects, which have used a cafe in some form. And we actually have a, a, a DSOC Sci that used a Jackie Gilson, who did an online cafe, which was actually quite interesting. And I was actually on her committee as well. Um, 
Fielding has had five doctoral dissertations, um, and a, a sprinkling of other institutions have also had uh, various degrees using a World Cafe. And so one of the things that we keep coming back to is the worldcafe.com site because it turns out that that's a great place to park materials. So there's a bibliography here, there's a, uh, a way for people to connect with others, there's sort of a, a blog here as well. And it's, it's been a, a really interesting process to sort of see how this, this plays out. Who's the audience for this book? Well, our thinking was clearly students, you know, anybody in sort of a, a postdoctoral process, but the more we started looking at what was published already and the kind of critiques that were made of the cafe, we realized that in fact other parts of the cafe are also understated. So for example, the role of the host in a cafe is sort of there, but sort of not. And in fact, the host has a huge impact on whether people speak, whether people feel safe to, to share their own stories. And so we realized actually that there's a much larger audience of people who are engaged in uh, large group dialogic change types of initiatives. And that was sort of became, oh, wow, so a, there really is a, a larger market here. So how did we actually do this? We received ethical approval uh, here uh, for doing an online cafe and for doing interviews and a variety, a variety of things. So we've actually done an online cafe which had people literally from around the world. Uh, Brazil, Sweden, uh, many in the United States, uh, all over Europe, the UK, uh, Germany, um, California. Uh, one person from Hong Kong. It's, it's been very, very rich in terms of how that worked out. People sort of sharing their experiences of working with students using a cafe and simply uh, their own sort of work with this. And then we actually had specialized conversations as well, which we transcribed. And that was on ethics, uh, design, uh, a, a range of issues. Where, where do they see the use of the cafe moving in the future? And then the last part was uh, keeping up with the literature on what is happening in the World Cafe has been fa absolutely fascinating. And then we've, we've been doing co-writing based on that. And it's, it's uh, been an interesting and frustrating experience. So Fred was in an accident. He had trouble seeing. He, he could, you know. So sometime in about January, uh, Rosa decided that, that she could not continue to work on this because her doctoral work was suffering. <laughs> so, so suddenly what went was four co-authors became two co-authors and so we're sort of still working on this, right? That's a great excuse, but it, it's, uh, it's the reality of how, how this has gone. Um, here's sort of what this book looks like. Um, Juanita is actually writing the foreword for us and it's very exciting with David, uh, her partner and co-author. Uh, the, so there's, a, there's a piece here around, so what is a World Cafe and how does it work? And, and why is that important? And actually the longer we're, we're working on this, one of the things that's become really apparent is that we are actually writing about how does large group uh, dialogic narrative process work in terms of promoting change? in organization, so it's, it's, it's gotten even beyond just the World Cafe, although that's been the principal focus up until now. Um, one of the questions that we've had to ask is, what is research? And some of the work that, that you're doing, Brian, has actually been quite helpful in terms of trying to articulate some of, some of these things because one of the things that we, I, started to notice right away is that in the qualitative methodological literature, the only legitimate, when I say legitimate in quotation marks, the only legitimate uh, method there is a focus group, and that only as a group interview, right? Because the idea that in fact what a group of people would, would uh, co-create has not been until very recently seen as a, a real, an important focus of research. It's really been about, I want to know 
Brian's ideas exactly. I, want to, I don't want that contaminated by what other people are saying. And it's, it, the focus then is on the researcher to do the data analysis to sort of accumulate all of the, the various data inputs, which are all supposed to be pure, which leads to validity, reliability, generalizability, which of course in an action process, we're talking about authenticity, not so much the other pieces here. So this, this what is research is actually really interesting. And oddly enough, there are lots of people for whom the idea of why do we have to play in the academic sandbox at all? Why can't we just do the organizational stuff that we're doing? And the whole point of the book has been as a bridge because it's really important. In this time that we've been doing the book, we've heard of multiple people who were essentially turned down from using a world cafe as one of their methods in a doctoral study. So part of what we're trying to do is to get something out to, to those folks who are supervising or serving in, in, uh, as research ethics boards, in fact, about this kind of, of work. Okay, this is sort of like, so what, what does this work out? And then, uh, and that was sort of an interesting topic on the World Cafe that we did. Uh, so how has it been used as research? And I'll show you just a few things with that. Uh, then there's a, some questions around design and ethics that I think is really important. Uh, one of the pieces is that one of the principles of a cafe, which is to maximize the diversity in the room, to lead, which leads to innovation, is a wonderful idea if this is just an activity in an organization, but doesn't exactly play very well when you're having to put this into the context of tricouncil ethics where now you've got power over ethics that sort of are intruding all over the place. So this is actually one of the reasons why in the research ethics application that's particular to the School of Leadership Studies, we actually included a, a little section in our version of this thing. And I, and I know Mary's going to change all this very shortly, but in our version of this, one of the things that we asked students to identify is if you're doing this, where else in your process are you allowing for people to have genuine, uncoerced data where they can put that into, the, into the, the inquiry that you're doing? So people have to have an opportunity to do this. And then there are also ways in which people have to think about how do they structure their cafe? So are people showing up with their reports or supervisor to a cafe if you're doing this in an organizational setting? Now that's something that the Tri-Council hasn't really spoken to as yet because the idea around the, these research ethics are really, it's all about the researcher's power over, not whether people in a, in a method have power over one another. These kinds of discovered uh, ethical issues, however, in a cafe used as research are, are actually quite significant and are really important. So there's different ways of doing this. You can have people, we've had students who've done parallel cafes for different levels of the organization and then have brought them together at the last to sort of talk about where things should go. That's sort of one approach to this. Uh, you can sort of say, okay, this first round I want people at this level of the organization on this table and other people at, at this table. So there's ways that you can do it internally in a cafe as well. But uh, people need to be sensitized to this as a, as a real issue. Um, okay, so where does this go? Uh, so what? Well, I think the, the so what in terms of the, the uh, using dialogic approaches, gr group methods of inquiry, really has a future because one of the pieces that we are seeing is really important is trying to be effective in the organization. So there's a, there's a piece here where if you're trying to create an applied research process, how is the organization using that? Like, what does that mean to the organization? So in some ways, we, we're trying to figure out how can we encourage this while at the same time people are cognizant of some of the tri-council issues, some of the hosting issues, some of the design issues. Um, and then sort of this a, con a conclusion, we've got lots of references and lots of resources. So. Very briefly, so the idea here is that 
We've got lots of backgrounds, and I'm, I'm aware of the time here too, so I'm thinking that I'm going to make the, this available to people, and I also have a, a reference list as well that I'm, I'm going to make, re make available as well. We can put up together with this so people can sort of see some of this. But you can see that, uh, and some of this were, were, were elements that Juanita was developing already in, you know, when she did her doctoral dissertation around social construction, around that the, the best kind of a cafe was focused on an appreciative process. What, what is it that people want to grow? Where should, how should uh, organizations try and move as opposed to trying to fix problems or deal with deficit issues? Just, just as a, an aesthetic style, uh, trying to make something work really well, particularly if you have a, a broad group of people in, in the room. Uh, clearly, this is a systems thinking issue if you're trying to maximize the number of people who are, who are there. And cafes have been done with, like, say, I've, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Bogien Palm in Stockholm, has done this with mayors and, and uh, assistant mayors from the EU in the Stockholm City Hall, that lovely golden, golden building, uh, with about 1,600 people. Now, that doesn't leave very much in terms of that's, I would not suggest doing data gathering with <laughs> that many people. It, it, you know, things get boiled down in a bit in a way that's not very helpful. Uh, but so, socio-technical systems clearly is part of this uh, com conversation, dialogue, all really important. And then some of the work that uh, Jervis Bush and uh, Bob Marshak are doing more recently around dialogic OD becomes really important. And, and in fact, what they're talking about here is, is really about how do people form collective ideas and what is, what is the process of, of uh, creating collective wisdom in a group. Okay, um, so, so what we're looking at here are the design principles and, and uh, what I can say is that uh, these are part of the cafe uh, and they sound simple, but are actually very difficult to implement accurately or, or, or well. And uh, each one of them has its own set of, of issues that, that fall out. And so, for example, uh, creating hospitable space. Um, what, is, what does hospitable space mean? Well, hospitable space means where people can come in and feel that it's a comfortable... Like, I'm, I'm going into a cafe, have a cup of coffee, you know, able to let down my, my, my guard in some ways, that I'm, I'm among friends. That's difficult to play out when you're trying to deal with the tri-council ethics, where you presume that there is a potential coercive element that's happening or potentially happening at all the time. If, if people have questions, don't hesitate to ask, okay? Um, this uh, cross-pollinate and connect diverse perspective is interesting. I've seen a variety of uh, projects where people kept the same group all three rounds of a cafe and didn't actually bother to change the groups and they simply had a list of questions and that, that was all that they, they did. And one of the points of this is really, you know, actually part of it is to, to share your experiences and to, to hear from other people so that you're maximizing your opportunity to, to really hear from different people listen to different ideas than, the, than what you walked into the room with. And then the harvest is also really interesting. Uh, and in the time that I've been talking to Amy and others, I've really changed and shifted my own thinking about how does harvesting work effectively. So um, I did a one for all with the faculty association a couple weeks ago. And I simply had each group report out when they did it. Um, but when I did this actually in Gothenburg with, with the, uh, the Action Research Plus Transformations gathering, I actually followed the idea around. So I had each table have one idea, and then I asked others to share that idea. And that worked extraordinarily well and kept the interest in the group really high. If you have just one table after another report out, oh, okay, I already covered that point, and either they've, they've, now they've got the point that I've wanted to cover. So it, there's, there are different ways in which you can do this. The other issue that, sh that shows up in this as research is the use of a table host, for example. Right? 
some, some people write about this as a facilitator, and in some ways it becomes like a, a focus group facilitator. And in some ways, when I've talked with Juanita about this, she sees that that's actually contrary to the spirit of the, the cafe. And Amy has actually called this, you know, over, um, she's trying to disintermediate individuals' responses to questions, right? So people can respond directly. And that happens if you actually treat the group as, yes, they're having conversations and tables, but you can hear from people individually throughout the room. Works, works really well, actually. Okay, so this idea that we are wiser together, sort of a little bit of collaborative, collective learning here, really. Um, we had Jervis Bush, Jervis, he says it rhymes with nervous, so Jervis Bush, come to our uh, leadership conference a couple years ago. And one of the things he said just has, like, just really stuck with me, which is that if you can change the story that a group of people are telling, you've actually changed reality for them. So, so in some ways, this is really about the collective meaning making that's at the heart of a cafe. And, um, uh, you know, Barrett, Thomas, and Hosevar sort of uh, talk about this as the discourse piece is actually at the heart of the core of any change process. Like that's where change actually starts. And it's really about forming the relationships with people. It's about uh, reinforcing or challenging structures that we might be holding in our minds. And really, uh, the idea that, in fact, as we converse, we are actually creating, you know, this is actually, you can see this. Everybody who's taught a cohort recognizes that that's what's going on. They're creating their own humor, they're creating their own language, they've got their own experiences that they're all pulling out of the, uh, the cohort experience. And so uh, it really is a social construction that, that they've got going on there. Okay, so when we start looking at the literature, here's what starts to happen. So, in fact, uh, where this, this goes is that there's, there have now been somewhere around 120, 130 uh, journal articles which include the cafe in some way, shape, or form. Uh, some do nothing with it. Some are, are doing this as a, as a mechanism for social design. And I had a, just a couple of, and I'll, I'll make the, the references that I've got available to people here. But So for example, uh, creating a framework for medical professionalism, they're, they gather together a community of practice of researchers or professional people to say, what should our next research question be? Where should this go? Which they then can work on using other, other uh, methods, right? So in some ways, this is, a, this is like a starting point for bringing people together. Um, I, the, you know, one of these is um, uh, investigating community perspectives on falls prevention information seeking and delivery older person perceptions regarding preferences for falls prevention education using a World Cafe approach. So bringing together people who have a, a concern on an issue, whether it's community people, whether it's a community of practice of professionals or other researchers, to essentially pull together some ideas as to what's important. And that's a really interesting way to think about this because then it has a shape on the design that people are actually pulling out. So the data gathering piece here. So people can use the small group breakouts and the plenary as their source of data. So their audio recording, they've got flip charts, they've got the materials that people are writing on the, on the tables all as, you know, as, as primary data. Now the flip charts are actually not primary data. This is already secondary data because these are synthesized points from what people have said. What people have actually said is their primary data. So this is always an issue with students. Oh, I'm just going to have the, uh, the flip charts. My very first supervision <laughs> was with a, a, uh, a young woman who uh, the only data points that she had were four flip charts. And it was like, okay, so how are you going to attribute any of these things? It's like a group said, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's, it makes for really not very 
useful or very robust data if, if you don't actually have some mechanism to, <laughs> to find the original source. So that's, that's really interesting. And then people are using these as very much like, like focus groups or a low moderated version of a focus group. Um, data validation, there was a, a really interesting uh, piece here where, so for example, um, regenerative medicine, stroke survivor and care reviews and motivations toward a proposed stem cell clinical trial using placebo neurosurgery. So you can see that there are all kinds of very involved topic areas where in fact people want to know, did we catch the right stuff here? Does this, is this meaningful? You know, and, and that's what they're actually doing here. Um, the action planning, very important. We sometimes in leadership studies call this the make it happen meeting, where we want people to bring your findings, bring what you've sort of heard from people, and actually have them engage in ways which will let, the, let this process move forward in some ways. So they, they're actually now doing some action planning with what they've found. And in some ways for an action project, it's really the, in the, the critical piece. Up until that point, it's the researcher, the student, who's holding all the cards. But until they actually bring this back together, uh, all they've really got is a report, potentially, that's going to sit on a shelf somewhere. So they, this, this last piece here, in terms of doing the action planning, becomes a really important part of the overarching action process, even though it may not be seen as a method around for, for, the, for the, uh, the ethical review. Right? So it's a, it's, you know, we're asking students actually to have a fairly sophisticated understanding of what they're doing. Um, and then, of course, disseminating research findings. And, and you can see that in lots of different places. Uh, and that's in addition to what the purpose that Juanita and David originally had, which was doing collective meaning making and relationship building and so on. But what I'm also seeing is that people who are using these last two approaches are actually then writing up a case study of what happened and then are testing what they're doing with other methods. So it's, it becomes a quite an interesting sort of range of how this is being used in the literature at this point. Okay, so that was sort of, uh, this takes me up to March of my, my uh, uh, research and scholarly leave. Uh, at that point, um, I had been having these conversations back and forth uh, with Hillary Bradbury about uh, what were they planning, how is this going to work out, and they had, they had a, a, a process and I sort of said, you might have some really good traction if you were to actually try a cafe with all the people who are coming who don't know each other. Yes, they had done a couple of pre-sessions online, so people had a little bit of an idea of who some of these folks who were showing up there were. but. Um, it's interesting. So uh, Chalmers was a great place to, uh, to have this happen. We um, uh, met on Vera uh, Sandberg Allais, which, you know, she's the first en female engineer, and this was on International Women's Day was the starting point for this, so it was, it was actually very exciting. But what Hillary was trying to do, and it continues to be trying to do, and um, is essentially bring together people who are engaged in action-oriented processes, particularly around issues of uh, trying to make transformative changes in the world. So whether, you know, on a, on a whole range of things here. So she's calling this action-oriented research for transformation, or ART, and they're calling them, you know, she's calling this thing, a, we're about being artists. Uh, playing on that. Um, this was sort of interesting because the idea here was to really catalyze this, this community. And I found, I found it actually very, very interesting because there were people, again, from around the world who were here, from Manila, from uh, South Africa, from South America, from uh, Costa Rica and Central America. Uh, really, really quite uh, fascinating. The UK, Sweden, of course. Um, and this, 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 some of the ideas here that they have in terms of how this might appeal to people was sort of uh, useful here. The one idea that she had was to create a global unifying learning platform, which she connected to universities or the concept of Ubuntu, for example, and really trying to figure out can, how can we network people who are doing this kind of work. 
uh, based on the Sustainable Development Goals. So this should look familiar since this is sort of what we're basing our Vision 2045 here at Royal Roads on and is a sort of a core part of all of this. Well, this is what uh, the Action Research Plus Transformations group is very much focused on as well. And in fact, uh, both Hillary Bradbury and Steve Waddell, who is the executive director of the SDG Transformations Forum, uh, who are the, were the co-sponsors of the, this gathering, have written a whole lot here in terms of a call to Action Research for Transformation. Um, and then some of the people who were there were part of this uh, 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 IPP group, which had actually presented a, a uh, essentially this, this global warming of 1.5 degrees. So really interesting, very pressing. Some of the figures and statistics that uh, the group heard were pretty discouraging, actually, in terms of the environment, I have to say. And we're trying to make the point that this kind of action-oriented process leading to transformation was really quite critical in the world today. And so that's sort of where this, this sort of started heading towards. And um, this is sort of the group at, at uh, Chalmers. And uh, you know, just a couple of photographs here. Whoops. This, uh, you know, looking at the, there were you know people coming in and out of this the whole, the whole time. It was sort of a fascinating uh, place. Um, there was one wall which was just biographies that people had written, and uh, this is uh, Alfredo who was from uh, San um, El Paso, Texas and uh, has been quite involved in, in the action research community for quite some time. Um, Hillary Bradbury on the right, uh, Thomas and Tim uh, as well, and uh, their idea here, you know, is really that this would potentially lead to things like, of course, the website, which they have, um, Exemplary project, which we're actually working on. Martin Leahy is, is working on that as well. Uh, learning journeys, face-to-face -face meetings, workshops, webinars, coaching, informal interactions, and uh, essentially uh, looking at this as creating conversation spaces for this network. So very, very interesting. They've formed a series of, as you can see, like uh, you know, 13 different, different uh, working groups. Um, and have sort of created a, a, a shared Google Doc, so just so you can see some of how this is playing out. Uh, as one example, this is sort of Miran, Miran Laria, who is in uh, the Basque country, San Sebastian, and uh, she's actually working on the idea of, of uh, territorial development, as, as she calls it. And the idea with this is very much about uh, connecting with others who are engaged in trying to do uh, action-oriented projects which connect to the sustainable development goals but are really about alleviating poverty or some of the other areas and it's really trying to figure out how do you create a relationship between an academic coming into a, a setting where people might actually be suspicious about academics because of, given the history of where things uh, have developed around and, and not too different or, or you know, from indigenous uh, studies in Canada, for example. But they're in the process of writing a follow-up to this and are really, they've got about, I think, 13 or 14 different projects and are looking for partners to actually uh, comment on or share some of the, the projects that they're working on too. So this is like an open invitation to people to participate and get some publications in as well. So I want to sort of throw this forward here. Um, this is some of the work that uh, Steve Waddell and Hillary are doing around really trying to, to move this forward in terms of creating a network of institutions that are su supportive of some of these kinds of transformational applied change. Um, and then they've just done a whole thing on an action research journal special issue on um, this action research transformation process with climate transformation. 
and as well as showcasing what others are doing here. So it's some really interesting work. Uh, Thomas is actually in South America and in, in doing his work. Uh, and you can sort of see that this is literally is a really interesting network, uh, which has, we're, we're there. Um, and um, you can see sort of some of the other global partners. Okay, we have about 15 minutes, a little bit under 15 minutes. And I'm wondering if we could just have a small table conversation here uh, on how might having a broader, you're going to leave us? <laughs> how, you've got to go. How might having an international collaboration be helpful uh, to your own research or interests? So in some ways what I'm sort of asking is, is, is this useful? How might this play out for you, especially given that we're sort of, you know, as an institution committed to the Ashoka process, what might that do to link to a few other projects as well? And then is there some interest here in terms of linking to other, other international projects? Uh, I just raised a couple of these, but you can see there, there are many more. Um, and then lastly, because this is coming back to my, my own interest area here, is any questions for, you, for me around the use of the cafe as a research method? So what I'd like to do is maybe just give you a couple minutes just to, you know, if you want to jot a minute or so just to jot down a come, some ideas on your own and then have a conversation with the people at your table. And you want us to follow the questions in that order or? Whatever works for you at this point, given the time that we have left is about 12 minutes. So if, if you want to just start in on the conversation, it's, it's like seizing the moment is probably more important than a particular order. We have five minutes left, <laughs> and I, what I'd like to actually do is invite the groups to sort of maybe take the microphone for the benefit of those who are watching this on the, on the video, uh, and just share what, what, what were some of your thoughts about this, and uh, what questions do you have? Yes, go for it. Um, yeah, we um, started talking about it um, as a methodology and how it might um, complement other methodologies. And Wanda um, had an example of using it um, with developmental evaluation. Um, I don't know if you want to okay. speak to it. Sure. <laughs> Uh, so we talked about a couple of points and kind of mixed these questions into, rolled into one. Uh, so one example uh, was the trafficking of children and trafficking of women and uh, a number of other issues that we as a group are trying to address using action research. World Cafe um, in particular is not what we actually used. I mean, we would sit around tables and discuss what the results were from the evaluation, how to change course. So in that sense, it was a very loosely applied form of a World Cafe, and we didn't use flip charts, but rather you know sheets of paper and note taking and so forth. But um, yeah, so this is one example where we applied action research, where normally an evaluation is just straight jacketed where you take steps and then you, you do an evaluation, you walk away. Here we applied what we learned and kept um, iterating whatever, what, whatever we decided to, to do based on not just how it was effective, but the environment as well, which was authoritarian. Um, and then we talked about some examples here at Rural Roads. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, so we actually use World Cafe when we're working um, with uh, team-based learning um, and, and exploring really effective use of teamwork. And so my, cur my curiosity was piqued when you said that, um, you know, as soon as you capture on a flip chart, there's a potential loss. And so my thought was, okay, if that's, the, what is our, what is the, my question would be, what would be the best way to capture without without diluting or losing important information, but also to not have so much information that it's overwhelming or there isn't a synthesis. So there must be some balance there, and I'm curious it to know how to do issue. that. It is a huge issue. And I've actually had a student who recorded every table, con small group table conversation, and then did a data analysis of, of everything. And I find that that's huge. Like, that's just way too much uh, data. And. Um, what I typically will suggest to students is that they record the report out pieces when there's a, a reporting going on. So at least they, they have a, 
the stories that are being told firsthand, even if it's just, just from one person. Um, but it is an issue because I think you do lose something, but it, at the very least to record report outs and transcribe that so you, then you have some original source material. But you can also use whatever people have written on the tables too. And in the online version of this, we've done this with a Google Doc. Um, you know, you, Padlet works. I've seen that done here where we use Padlet, and that, that can be quite effective as well. Can I ask this group here to, to share some of their thinking? They actually have a mic. Do you want to just say what you said, Pedro? Um, we had uh, the beginning of what looked like an, an exciting conversation, so we'll try to find time to follow up later. But two key ones. Um, are there any best practices or suggestions that you have seen and identified through your career that will help answer the question of, of, of how to make the process? I see the value of a flexible process, right. but at the same time, I, I, I've seen uh, criticism against World Cafe and AR on how free, it is so free that some key content knowledge pointers might be lost, right? There's someone transcribing what someone said, a team uh, presenting a summary of what other individuals said previously. Is there any, any better practices or suggestions on how to make sure that there's nothing lost through the process of uh, data collection or so that's a, Yes, and, and again, it depends on, on how you see this. If you see this as inviting a, a community of practice to share ideas so that you can sort of fine tune sort of things that you want to follow up on or that you're trying to validate, which are different purposes, you could, you could have, there's different ways of using this. As a data collection tool, um, I think actually the best thing you can do is to, is to audio record the pres outputs from, from each table, where at least someone is reporting back what they heard. That's still a bit on the secondary side, but at least it's clo the closest that we have. What about people who are shy about speaking in public? although World Cafe tries to make an environment as safe and, and protective as possible. What about cultures? There might be cultures, if we were thinking about international research, that might not be as um, comfortable as opening up and, and, and sharing their thoughts. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, this has been used very successfully in, in Mexico and South America, where people bring together peer audiences and uh, to, for them to sort of share their thoughts. And because it, it's a small group, you, you, it's really important that you not sort of mess, or mess up with the uh, potential coercive participation. But um, it, it is possible to lose some of the conversation and the comments made by people who wouldn't be necessarily as uh, assertive or um, uh, you know that's a, that is an issue, and and the the best thing that I can think of is that that's where training the person who's a host uh -huh. at a, at the small table, if they're recording something, th then they you know now, you know if you look at this in terms of uh, who supports this, so we've got World Cafe community, we've got the Art of Hosting that also works with the World Cafe, but also work with other approaches. Um, they each have different ways of doing this and different trainings that they offer. And we noticed that that's one of the areas where there is a real need. And we actually have a, a journal article that we're about to send off to, to Hillary here on uh, training hosts because that, that, that's a, that is a shortcoming. A, a final question, if we have the time. Um, those individuals that are supportive of World Cafe and they are, are very vocal about it. They, 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 support it actively. But I suspect that there's still a community uh, that do not necessarily see it as an appropriate research method. Do you have any insight into those arguments and whether that is still a challenge for the expansion and growth of AR and, and World Cafe, Cafes as research accepted research method? So it depends on how you're using it. Right? That's, I think that's more the case of, of what it is that's, that's an issue. Uh, this is being used across professions at this point as a mechanism in a variety of ways. Um, 
In terms of this as data gathering, however, it does have a problem in that it, it is any time you get a group of people having a conversation, uh, this isn't repeatable. Like, and that's from, for some epistemological framings of research, gee, we need to have a process that's repeatable. You know, Brian, you, this would be actually a great conversation to have because that's part of the challenge, I think. Um, you know, if I look at this in terms of um, you know, Academy of Management, for example, I've, I've mentioned this to you at one point before, uh, the many professions are still very much in the thrall of the statistical analysis, and uh, for them, that, this doesn't work, no question. But again, you, there are different ways of doing this, and you can clarify and research questions and then use other methods to, to do that. So there, there's a whole range of ways in which that, that could in fact happen. So it's not necessary that, you, that this is the only method that one would we use in an inquiry. And I'm, you know, the, the conversation about action research or action-oriented research really requires a, a much broader conversation than we have time for right now, which I would love to do. Did, did you have a? Yeah. Let me give you the microphone so that our friends. And then we have. Um, <laughs> just a quick thought when this conversation was going on is that can all the stakeholders be included in a world cafe? The stakeholders on which whom the research has been done, about whom? Can all these stakeholders be brought to the table and have a conversation with? So. The, the way you've just framed the question is actually really important. So part of what, what this process is trying to do is to actually make it not so much that it's, it's on people, but rather with people, right? So that, in fact, if we were doing a project, it would be because you have a real interest in finding out something, or you, you think that you're at a table here because you know that other people hold part of the, the picture, part of a, of, a, of a solution to something that you're working through. Right? So, so the, the challenge is how do you create a space that's safe enough for people to feel that they can share their part of the puzzle? Right? So that, that's where this becomes much more of a participatory process rather than sort of a more traditional objective kind of scientific research. But, but even the, the, the definition of what is scientific is, is in flux, quite frankly. OK. Any other final comments? And then I have to, I have to thank you We're already over time. Thank you so much, Niels. I really appreciate you taking the time to share this with us. Oh, well, thank you. For coming. <laughs>